Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast that delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought out by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. Welcome to episode 184 of the Naturally Nourished podcast. Today we are talking all about the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal feedback loop of your body's stress response. And this is a system that we talk about all the time and Allie really covers in depth in the anti-anxiety diet, but with everything going on in the world right now and last week's topic on cognitive health and brain function, we really feel that we can go even deeper on these glands that regulate a fight or flight versus rest and digest mode. Absolutely. So it's become even more apparent (laughs) every day that the calendar turns and we wonder where we are in the world, uh, that it's really important to ensure that we are harnessing, as I like to call it, the wild stallion of the brain, uh, that we're all understanding the influence of uncertainties and unknowns if we allow that course to drive us in a space of anxiety, panic, and chronic stress how that influences our whole body health. So in last week's episode, we decided to release the adrenal rehab program at 50% off. And we're going to keep that through the end of the month of April. And um, I wanted to just really ensure that in today's episode, we can teach you more about the hypothalamus and the pituitary because we've done a lot of episodes on the adrenals. So we've Uh, run episode 11 way back in the day called the HPA access. And then we do have episode 13 called adrenal fatigue. But in the more recent world, we have running on adrenaline, which is episode 129. We have how to rebound your adrenal glands, which is episode 158. And that was really in the birth of adrenal rehab programming. So we really tend to focus a lot of our energy at the end point of this HPA axis, which is that you know star of the show, the adrenals. And I really want to include more of the regulatory function of the hypothalamus, the processes of homeostasis, or how the body tries to achieve that set point at a time time of stress. And then I really think that the pituitary is such a powerful gland when we look at reproductive health, hormone management, and metabolism. So today we'll be kind of nerding out down the rabbit hole on HPA axis and how you can get your hypothalamus and pituitary to support whole body health, as well as mood stability and hormone balance. Yes, super important to give those glands a little bit of love because they do a lot for us yes. in our bodies. And, <laughs> and we'll find out just kind of the, the breadth of that in a little bit here. Um, before we jump in, let's have a quick word from our opening sponsor for this episode, ourselves, Naturally Nourished Supplements. Yes. Uh, So Naturally Nourished Supplements provide purity, potency, and efficacy. As you guys know, I thoroughly believe that supplements are powerful tools to be used to elevate your health, really to ensure that you're in that thrive versus survive mode. But it often requires the guidance of a trusted practitioner or a functional medicine guide to help you determine what's the best tool for your body and what synergy or balance of formulas work best for you and how to modify or adapt those based on the ever-changing shifts going on in your body, maybe of stress or maybe of metabolic shifts or exercise or new dietary changes. So with the new launch of AllieMillerRD.com that we're releasing in mid-May, we will be providing you a lot of resources, protocols, and quizzes to help you to determine an entry point of using the Naturally Nourished Supplement line, as well as, of course, as we continue to release the podcast episodes, which can really be a clinical guide to connect the story back to you. And then as our formulations are going to always be providing you confidence interval that you are getting 
quality formulas that are really medical grade. Um, it requires a medical license to be able to provide these potent, effective formulas that yield clinical outcomes. And I'm able to provide these at Allie Miller RD to you along with a pricing guarantee that notes that you will always get two to 5% lower pricing than the market industry standard. And I can provide you a product guarantee that all of the supplements in my line will always be third party assessed to ensure that they are free of mold, toxins, contaminants, and that they contain the stated active ingredients in the dosages noted. All of my probiotics are ID strain guaranteed. And we really push forward a science first principle, ensuring that we are on the cutting edge of research of quality formulations, uh, synergy formulations, meaning ingredients that work together to enhance bioavailability, absorption, and utilization with your body. And all of the formulas are non-GMO, gluten-free, free of all forms of soy, and beyond quality controlled. So go on over to Allie Miller RD where you can get started and find formulas to elevate your health. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Let's jump in and let's just do a little bit of quick foundational work. Um, and I'll have you set the stage for our HPA access and the connection of why this matters so much in our body. Sure. So it essentially is what regulates our autonomic nervous system and what determines whether we are in a sympathetic fight or flight mode or a parasympathetic rest, digest, and as I love to say, regulate mode. So the hypothalamus and pituitary are located in the brain. The adrenals are two tiny walnut-sized glands that sit above our kidneys. And the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access is our primary survival regulator in the body. Now, this creates distress or chronic stress signaling in a modern society where our schedules are often too high demanding. You know, this is further intensified with technological innovations and <laughs> the bombardment of communication that we're receiving in all assets. And then that's adding insult to injury when we're balancing that with blue light and the impact that that blue light has on our brain, driving a chronic stress response or keeping us overactivated. Um, and the HPA axis when in a chronic stimulated mode can drive truly destructive imbalance. So when the HPA axis is chronically in that fight or flight response, this can influence things like body temperature, satiety, or appetite regulation. We can see issues with fluid retention. Um, we can see hypothyroid or hyperthyroidism, metabolic impact, including blood sugar dysregulation, blood pressure elevation, or hypotonic to low of blood pressure, electrolyte imbalance, and so much more. Okay. And then, like you said, we've really kind of glazed over the hypothalamus and the pituitary, or I guess we've covered these aspects, but maybe not done as deep of a dive as we have with the adrenal glands. They seem to just steal the show. Yes. Um, so <laughs> let's highlight both of these regions in the brain and talk a little bit about their impact on mood, hormones, metabolism, and really whole body health. Sure. So the hypothalamus, again, is in the brain and it's the primary regulator of homeostasis in the body. And this is where, where really the body is trying to achieve balance based on shifts in the environment, um, uh, based on changes maybe in like external temperature or circadian rhythm. Um, the hypothalamus regulates predominantly our body temperature, our sleep, our energy, our appetite regulation, and then it is going to be the primary stimulator to the pituitary directly, where then we see the influence on fluid regulation and hormones. And then it also directly and indirectly via the pituitary stimulates and drives influence from the adrenal glands. So when we're looking at body temperature, we're looking at regulation of even things like sweat, um, so often we've talked about in a couple episodes how a lot of people go right away to thinking of estrogen issues with hot flashes or whatnot. And this can be an imbalance in the HPA axis where we get um, irregular body temperature um, or body temperature dysregulation, if you will, and 
excess sweat output um, or shivering and cold, um, clammy appendages, uh, cold hands and feet. This can be hypothalamic dysregulation. We can also see uh, hair growth, and this can be hormone mediated, but also hypothalamic mediated. We can see that the thyroid is directly influenced because the hypothalamus makes our thyrotropin releasing hormone. Um, and so the thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH is made in the pituitary, but the thyroid releasing hormone is actually made in the hypothalamus. So if you're not releasing hormone, then the stimulation feedback really doesn't, doesn't matter if, if the thyroid can't release the hormone in the first place. Uh, we see that leptin and we've dug a lot into leptin in past episodes. Leptin is that primary satiety hormone. This crosses the blood brain barrier and it targets the hypothalamus. So this is that primary regulating center for whether we're satiated or satisfied at mealtimes or whether we're dealing with chronic cravings or um, binge eating or dysregulation. In fact, we see chronic calorie restriction or disordered eating as one of the number one drivers of hypothalamic amenorrhea or that lack of satiation hitting the hypothalamus pushing the body to stop cycling because the body perceives food insecurity, if you will. Then on the hormone side of things in the hypothalamus, we make our gonadotropin releasing hormone. So this directly drives the pituitary to influence the ovaries or testes, whether you're female or male, to make your sex hormone. And it also is going to, like I said, hit the adrenals with the CRF or corticotropin releasing factor. And that drives the pituitary to stimulate ACTH to then produce cortisol as a chronic stress response. Okay. And then beyond the hypothalamus, which we would say is kind of the primary regulator for homeostasis or, or a lot of these very basic functions. Let's talk about the pituitary. And I think we'd say that the pituitary is a bigger focus on hormones as a priority. Yeah, I, I would. I would. Um, so there is that gonadotropin releasing hormone element of the hypothalamus. And interestingly enough, there's been a lot of research on like human connection. Um, I believe that a lot of this connects with the production of oxytocin and vasopressin. Now, these are actually made in the hypothalamus, but stored in the pituitary. And, and like I said, these are direct stimulating glands. So they have a lot of kind of cat and mouse <laughs> or, or communication uh, back and forth to one another. But we do see in the beginnings of a romantic relationship, like when we talk about the butterflies or like that actual physiological like warmth and like feeling of release of stress or anxiety when when we're feeling the impact of romantic love, um, that that's actually very triggered by the hypothalamus and likely it's that oxytocin, that, that connection. But the pituitary is really thought of as the releaser of that oxytocin. So the pituitary is probably more of the more popular regulator in the sense of hormones um, and maybe even more so in metabolism because of that TSH. The pituitary gland is a small oval shaped gland that's located basically behind your nose um, in the underside of the brain. And it's attached directly to the hypothalamus by this really cool looking stalk like structure. And the um, area of the pituitary has two different sections, an anterior and posterior lobe. So the pituitary in general is going to be the driver of our sexual hormones, our fertility, we definitely think of in this world, as well as that bliss connection, um, which can really be natural antidepressant and trust or anxiolytic release of anxiety fluid retention because our anti-diuretic hormone is regulated here. And then the kind of um, stimulator from that TSH of the thyroid, as well as a stimulator to the adrenals with the ACTH. So some of the, the nerdy behind the scenes players of this game is, like I said, the anti-diuretic hormone or ADH. Um, and this is going to regulate fluid, nausea, thirst, fluid retention, blood pressure. This is one that I really attribute likely to some of the drivers of when we're talking about um, like morning sickness and with the early onsets of pregnancy because the pituitary is focusing so much 
of its energy on regulating ovarian and fertility hormones, like production of progesterone, maintaining optimized demand um, of regulation of a lot of that world, that we start to see imbalance in the antidiuretic hormone. Um, we also see, as I mentioned, TSH regulated here, growth hormone. So actual growth hormone, HGH, uh, human growth hormone is put out by the pituitary gland and that can regulate our bone health. It can regulate our growth and development, of course. It can regulate our metabolism because we know muscle mass and HGH are tight trend. And the more muscle mass we have, the more metabolically active our tissue um, and then prolactin is one that I have not mentioned. This plays a big role with um, breast milk production and development in breasts, but we think of prolactin going excessive or too high in a chronically stressed individual, and that's one of the markers of an indication of infertility with HPA axis imbalance, high prolactin levels. So if you're looking at fertility and, and you're still kind of wondering the whys and haven't had prolactin checked, that would be an important one to look at. And then I mentioned the ACTH is one of the primary components of the adrenocorticotropic hormone. And this is what directly drives the stimulation of the adrenal cortex to put out that cortisol. Um, and the ACTH itself, though, can start to provoke panic and distress um, as it stimulates those um, adrenaline-like compounds from the adrenals. But there's feel-good players in the pituitary as well, beyond the oxytocin release that's made in the hypothalamus and beyond um, some of these other feel-good connectors, we make endorphins and we also um, make other similar compounds to endorphins that relieve pain and um, reduce pain effects in the body. So a lot of functions for this teeny tiny little gland for sure. And that's just one part of it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the the anterior does so much and it even plays a level in like your um, melanocytes or basically the uh, cells in the body that influence pigmentation. I mean, there's so much going on there. And then the posterior lobe is basically thought of as like a storage site. Um, the posterior lobe is where we hold the hormones that the hypothalamus made, um, but the uh, posterior uh, part of the pituitary will hold these. And that's the vasopressin, which is again, connected to the antidiuretic hormone and aids in dehydration and water retention, uh, blood pressure in the body, as well as the oxytocin, which again, again, is that bliss reward orgasm release. It plays a role with empathy connection, but it also functionally stimulates the release of breast milk. Okay. So a lot of jobs for a teeny tiny little gland. Um, and I think it's more known to see um, pituitary abnormalities than hypothalamic abnormalities recognized kind of in the medical world. Um, let's just talk about kind of some of the common conditions and some of the interventions used in the medical field. Yes. And I, I mean, I believe it to be because if there was like a hypothalamic uh, tumor, for instance, or anatomical impact on the hypothalamus that the individual likely wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be viable. Um, the individual wouldn't be able to live. Um, whereas it's actually very common to see pituitary tumors. Um, I have worked with thousands of patients now, and I can at least name seven of them that have had a uh, pituitaryectomy or meaning their pituitary being removed. Um, or have had um, a pituitary tumor removed or you know, uh, procedures to suppress pituitary tumor growth. Um, and, and so they're often non-cancerous, they're not malignant, um, but they can definitely interfere with the release of all of these things. So often my clients that are on, um, have dealt with pituitary tumors are also going to be on like hydrocortisone, right? So they're going to be on a form of cortisol. They're often going to be on a, uh, thyroid medication like Synthroid or levothyroxine or you name it. Um, and they're often going to also be on sexual hormone, um, replacement because of that, that impact across the board of the gland. And then there tends to be like blood pressure issues and, and other other um, downstream impacts. Uh, we can see uh, hypopituitarism or too low of output by the gland. Um, and that can often, the big driver where we see that influence, just like the hypothalamic amenorrhea is often with reproductive system function. Um, we can see uh, Cushing's disease, which is when the pituitary gland stimulates too much ACTH, and that drives an excess output of um, adrenal compounds. 
Um, we can also see in following traumatic brain injury, this being a big time where the pituitary takes a hit and a lot of this regulation can be impacted, um, which can even drive downstream influence on memory, communication, behavior. And when we think of mainstream medicine, there's definitely drugs that can reduce, if there is a pituitary tumor, reduce excess stimulation of sexual hormones, um, also you know, reducing uh, growth factors and you name it. But one unrelated to pituitary tumors is Clomid. So Clomid is the you know, most popular infertility drug, and this actually blocks estrogen production and uh, stimulates the hypothalamus and the pituitary by falsely giving uh, blocking of estrogen um, that's circulating. It blocks the estrogen receptors so that um, the body produces more of our gonadotropin releasing hormone, more follicular stimulating hormone, and more luteinizing hormone. So that false feedback kind of creates like a slingshot effect. And um, that's going to catalyze then the maturation of egg follicles and increase the chances of ovulation. Gotcha. And because we've gone through the H and the P now, let's just briefly cover the A or the adrenals since all of these are very intrinsically connected. Yeah, most definitely. And I just want to say, because I always feel like I have to give it a natural <laughs> method to the madness. Um, I think we're due for another infertility episode, you know, as I'm kind of processing through a lot of this. And so I'm going to put that in my list of to do's. It'll be coming out in the next, let's say two months. And um, I've just been releasing a lot of new information on relax and regulate our product. And the myo-inositol, a four gram dosage of myo-inositol can increase ovulation by 63%. So, you know, drugs like Clomid really kind of shoot in the dark and suppress a feedback mechanism and create this slingshot when we might just want to start with focusing on the ovaries first and fueling them with nutrients that the body knows what to do with and understands. And you know, that's always my food is medicine and functional medicine approach is what does the body need? What is imbalanced? And what does the body use to get back into a balanced state versus blocking a feedback mechanism and trying to trick the body? <laughs> I never think that that tends to work out in the, in the mainstream. And um, that's why Clomid has a lot of undesirable uh, side effects for sure. So yes, going to the adrenals. Um, you know, the adrenals, like you said, Becky, are the star of the show. They're the primary fight or flight responders in the body. Um, they provide the steroids in the cortex area. So this is cortisol, which we don't like to demonize anything. The body makes everything with purpose, right? So too much cortisol often gets demonized, but we also are concerned if we are overly suppressed and we don't have ample cortisol because we know that Cortisol plays a role in um, antihistamine effects. It's anti-inflammatory, so it can help with pain management. It uh, provides us a cascade of energy, so it can deal with chronic fatigue when it's off. And then, yes, if cortisol is overstimulated, we can deal with insomnia and panic and body fat gain and um, fatty liver and increased leaky gut. So there's definitely a, a sweet spot of where we want that cortisol to, to sit. Uh, in the cortex of the adrenals, we also make aldosterone, which is connected to kind of like that vasopressin and antidiuretic hormone. Aldosterone regulates our blood pressure and the sodium levels in our body. This is where with adrenal fatigue, we often are very thirsty and we crave salt. And then DHEA is the other uh, player from the adrenal cortex. And um, this is really that metabolic hormone that can play a role with sexual hormone function, metabolizing into estrogen or testosterone. Um, it plays a big role with resilience and stress rebound. And then in the medulla of the adrenals is where we make the catecholamines or stress responding chemicals in the brain. And that is our dopamine, the reward bliss seeker, as well as our norepinephrine and epinephrine. And those are in layman's terms terms, basically are regulators of adrenaline. And I think it's safe to say that with what's going on right now with shelter in place and uh, the, you know, stay at home orders, there's definitely a lot of uncertainty right now. And I think this is starting to show up as a kind of a, a chronic daily stressor for a lot of us. So um, this is really the first area of focus for regulating the access, but often regardless of the experience of stress, you know, we know its effects can take a toll on whole body health. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that 
acknowledging things being different and things being out of our control and being proactive even before maybe we experience quote unquote stress or anxiety <laughs> is so important because I mean, I, I know when I put out the book, The Anti-Anxiety Diet, I took the premise that anxiety is the Achilles heel, right, of whole body wellness. And um, a lot of people don't resonate with that term anxiety. You know, they think of that as like a, a mental illness or a, a diagnosis and they don't want to name it or claim it. But I think when we think about this HPA axis and how things can overdrive or imbalance the feedback of these three very important glands, we start to see the importance of harnessing and balancing them so that we can be more resilient to stress. Um, because there is that connection of stress on digestion and gut health and inflammation. And now we're discussing deeply sexual hormone function, fertility, thyroid. And when you open up that you know, bag of worms, <laughs> then I think pretty much everyone listening is like, oh yeah, I can see why I would want to balance my HPA axis beyond the perception of stress response. Totally. And, and it really is just all connected. And I think that becomes much more obvious when there is a chronic stressor and we start to see things going awry a little bit in our bodies. Um, let's go ahead and share with listeners just some updates and kind of personal uh, practices we've been putting into place to stay balanced and positive during this time of uncertainty. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we've talked about in past episodes, but I just think it's so important to really harness the, the mind. And, and I will share a little bit more that research on you know the nocebo effect and, and negative thoughts in a little bit. Um, but the first thing that you can do to kind of counter fear of unknown is practicing gratitude. Um, asking yourself based on this time, like what expectations of normal are, are you going to release each day? Um, you know, so one of them is like maybe even thinking in the constructs of, of wardrobe or thinking about what lunchtime is or, you know, different things that you had in a ritual if you were leaving your house to go to work. Um, you know, what types of things are you going to, to maybe release and what things can you gain? What things in your old routine aren't serving you? And that's an important piece of the puzzle. I was talking to a client um, just a couple of days back and she was saying, you know, <laughs> I'm in the car two to three hours a day with my standard, you know, lifestyle because I'm driving my three kids back and forth to, to three different schools and have three different schedules and activities. And I have an extra two to three hours every day that I'm actually connecting with them versus I feel like I'm barking at them less. I feel like I'm, you know, sharing with them and experiencing with them versus telling them where they need to be, what they need to be doing. So maybe that's a part of the old routine that wasn't working for that mom was like over committing, right? Um, or um, not connecting, over committing and under connecting, I think is a really interesting dynamic that we might see even within our personal relationships. Um, I think taking time to get outside is so important. Uh, we talk about this a lot in the adrenal rehab program, but right away, if you can, within the first two hours of rise, get your butt outside so that you can experience that circadian reset to get that bright light into your brain, to hit that pineal gland, to help to support the regulation of your melatonin. That's such a powerful brain support and antioxidant boost, immune support for your body, um, and really harnesses this HPA axis as far as regulating circadian rhythm. So getting outside, getting into fresh air, and getting bright daylight, really important. And on the latter end of that, I think something to watch during this time is countering the screen time. Um, you know, I'm finding that the screen time, unfortunately, is one of our primary ways to connect. And um, luckily, Becky and I kind of already having shifted our lifestyles to working at home, you know, we have all of the crazy red screens on our devices and blue blocker glasses. So I'll be sure to link those in the show notes. Um, and maybe we'll link a, a blog again, Becky, on how to reset your screen lighting, you know, on various devices. Cause I think that's super helpful. Um, but that's like the counter piece. So it's always important. You can ask yourself something you're adding, something you're releasing versus, and, and the language choice is so important. Intentional language with what you allow in your mental space. What am I releasing today versus what can't I do today? Very different as far as how that is impacted in the body, um, and in the mind. 
Uh, and then I, I can't say beyond the outside, how am I moving my body? Um, how am I maintaining muscle mass? And then the last question that I would kind of pose is in the world of beauty. Um, what beauty am I creating, cultivating, or inviting in today? So what am I witnessing or taking part of? And that's something that we've really done a lot of. And, and I was telling Brady, like, oh, this is a silver lining, our third night of painting rocks. <laughs> <laughs> where I was like, you know, painting rocks is actually super cool and super, um, there's a lot of meditation that goes into this process. I'll link our um, really cool pens. They're these like paint yeah. pens that you can use on any surface. And, um, you know, I was like, I don't know if we would ever stop and pause and paint rocks together. Um, but this is a really great way that we're able to cultivate, um, you know, beauty in our space. Totally. You're going to have so many painted rocks, but... <laughs> I know. <laughs> By the end of this, oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. Um, and and at, maybe, how, how have you been keeping like with schedule, Becky? Um, I, I thought that there was a really interesting connection that Dr. Deb uh, did in the month of March, which we're past that, but she has the sisterhood of the Shakti sisterhood. And um, I'll link that again as a resource for those of you that are looking to kind of connect and find spirituality and hope and um also release uh, during this time, but she talked about the connection of like color and Ayurvedic principles um, and each color um, associating with the day of the week, which I think is interesting because there's that like running joke of it's like, it's March 56th today. <laughs> <laughs> Where yeah. are we? What are we doing? March 97th. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, she said like, you know, Monday, it should be a color. Um, we think of like Lunas. Um, is that correct? Spanish? Yeah. Spanish. Spanish? Yep. Yeah. Um, so it's the moon. Monday is moon mm -hmm. day and it's white and that should be a day of inspiration and reflection. And the moon's energy is very feminine. You know, we think of the moon as the menstrual cycle and this is time to think inward um, instead of like the modern day, you know, Sunday blues going into Monday of thinking of that being a masculine, like attack day. I really like that. I'm like, Ooh, I'm going to harness that. Like every Monday is going to be moon day. Um, so she talked about wearing white and then, you know, she was talking about uh, Friday being associated with Venus and that being the love and compassion day. So pinks and reds as being an associative color. And she's like, you can play with your wardrobe to, you know, provoke and tell yourself what energy you want to harness in that day. And um, people do that with gemstones or chakra colors, you know, so there's that color association maybe that helps us guide through the calendar, if you will. Um, but I find nature does that too. Like we're, we're in the time frame right now of blue bonnets in Austin. So I'm really loving seeing all the wildflowers coming into bloom and hearing the birds chirping every day because that's a very kind of methodic, um, still standardized happening, like, like nothing's on hold. You know, the, everything's still happening. We're still living our lives. We're not waiting for our lives to start again. Totally. Just looking to nature. The fact that spring still came despite us being quarantined. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm definitely not using color to guide my, my schedule of the week, but I could find some inspiration in that with like what yoga pants I put on <laughs> every day. <laughs> and see, is that a good, I mean, that that's, and, and I would see your, again, your routine shifted from clinic, like what, 10 months ago, almost now, right? Right. So do you find that as a positive liberation or is that feel stifling as far as like wearing more relaxed wardrobe per se? Oh, it's, I mean, it's great. And <laughs> we're in the process of moving. And I was like, I can pack up literally everything because I don't have anywhere to go that I would wear any of these nice clothes anyway. Like it would usually be maybe weekends I put on jeans or if I have, you know, a date night planned or a dinner with friends or something. So I packed up everything except like seven pairs of yoga pants <laughs> and sports bras <laughs> and t-shirts. And it takes a lot of that like you know, uh, pressure off of what am I going to wear today and, and all that kind of that, like having a uniform piece of the puzzle. So I like it. I'm into it. And I have like forced myself one day a week to get dressed up ish, I guess. Um, you know, I mean, just outside of the norm or maybe like putting actually maybe mascara on or lipstick on one day of the week, just to kind of like shake it up, even if I'm not going anywhere. Um, and, and that's been kind of fine, but, but just making sure I don't get myself into too big of a slump but I'm really enjoying the slow down pace of more time in the kitchen. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a total foodie like Becky as well. And I enjoy experiencing all the you know newest farm to table restaurants. And I like 
getting out into the city at least one night a week. But I've been finding, you know, peace in the soul in the solace of, 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 just slower pace. Um, Brady and I are looking at uh, building a victory garden. Um, you know, so thinking back to like World War II when there was food insecurity and sourcing issues, we've definitely found so much light and connection with our CSA, our community supported agriculture. Um, we use a CSA for meat as well, Yonderway Farm. Um, so we kind of had those direct farmer relationships established, which I, I think that this time shines the light on, you know, this is another area. We need to look at like what's unsustainable. How can we make measures to ensure that we have secure food systems? And that comes with decentralizing our agriculture and food production. So keeping your local economy booming and continuing to vote with your dollar and if able to go to your farmer's market, all really important things. And so after um, Easter weekend, which I'm planning to also diverge all of my energy into making Uber epic, <laughs> like all of the things. Um, after that weekend, I'm going to do Victory Gardens. And um, we're also going to be building our chicken shack because that was my goal for March that got yeah. pushed. But like Trixie, Beatrix, and Joyce, we're coming for you. Those are my, my three chicken names. <laughs> now. Can you yeah. get chicks? Because there's been a shortage of, in addition to yeah. the toilet paper, there's been a run on chicks. Yeah, no, there are. <laughs> there are, um, I think they're called pullets, um, uh -huh. are like the one to three year or whatnot, where they're like just starting eggs. So I'm going to start with pullets instead of okay. chicks. I've been doing my research. So cool. I got my location. I'm not saying it out loud because I want to make sure I have enough nope. chicks for me. Nope, nope. <laughs> Don't tell anyone yet until the shortage has passed. Until I'm sharing um, them on Instagram. Until they're Instagram famous. Exactly. <laughs> oh Beatrix gosh. and Joyce. Can't wait. Yep. <laughs> the little ladies. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's a few things we're looking forward to as we um, relocate. I guess I can say it on here. We're moving to Austin, everybody. Um, <laughs> yeah, you haven't seen it on, on Instagram already. Byron and I just bought a house kind of in the midst. So we're in the start of all this crazy and I'm looking forward to getting in there and just like resettling, really spending time cultivating our space, which I feel like I'll have more time to do over the next several weeks. Yeah. Um, and definitely high priorities are getting a garden rocking in the back. I don't know if I'm allowed to have chickens yet um, per Byron, not per the neighborhood, but I'm going to see how yours go first. <laughs> okay, fair, fair. You can come visit mine. Exactly. Exactly. See how much work they really are and... <laughs> yeah, and what I, we're I, able to take on. And I think the slower pace also is going to allow us to really stay timely on our launch of the YouTube channel. So y'all stay really yeah. excited about that. Keep us on our game. Um, and we're super excited to start to basically release content that'll be more kitchen and food oriented based on each week's podcast topic. So yeah. really this is cool supposed stuff. to be a really busy season going into the conferences and events and travel and things. And it's just all kind of off the table and, you know, taking it for, for the blessing that that is. And, and, uh, we'll be refocusing on being able to actually get the YouTube stuff out in a timely manner. Yes. As always, whenever we can manifest what is versus obsessing about what is not totally. and why and things that we can't control or understand, is this a 5g thing? Is this a virus? <laughs> is this chemical warfare? Either way, we're here. Um, so yeah. same kind of ways that we support the terrain to enhance the immune system's ability to reduce viral replication and ensure that the immune system is sound in its ability to combat pathogen, whatever its name is, whatever its form is, and also upregulate detoxification, you know, working on grounding, working on offsetting the energetic shifts um, that we continue to move forward with an industrialized society. And, um, you know, we're all in the space to, to move forward and claim our territory and keep things cosmically connected and, and in a positive light. Totally. And then, you know, as we do get back to normal, it'll happen. Um, considering like what parts of, of your normal, I keep reading that places. And I like that, like what parts of normal are worth going back to and what yeah. hasn't been serving you that you can just kind of leave in the dust of all of this. And I think a couple of the positive lights, I'm hoping that we'll all take more proactive care in our wellness. And I'm hoping that also in a sense of community, the connectedness, you know, I, I always used to say, like, 
remember when we would go, maybe this is a bad example, but remember when we'd be at an airport and um, we'd like sit at the bar uh, pre smartphones and like you would talk to people about where they're flying and like, Hey, where are you in from? What mm -hmm. are you doing? <laughs> do to do. Um, and now it's just like scroll, 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 phone disconnect. Is there even a human next to me? And I think that as we really work um, in finding more human connection and taking out some of the artificial intelligence, intelligence, um, that that's going to be a really big way to offset this. And hopefully, although we are using screen time a lot right now to stay connected, when we get back in 3D space, <laughs> that maybe we'll really respect and honor the human connection beyond the, the screens. Totally. Every time I go to the grocery store, which isn't often, I'm like trying to have this long conversation with the cashier <laughs> just because <laughs> it's one of the only people I've talked to in person other than my husband in, yeah. in weeks. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, when stress stimuli, you know, when stress is high and, and how this impacts the HPA access, you know, it'll go into overdrive mode, but, um, or you'll put out access of these stress responding chemicals. So let's talk about just the physiological impact of stress and where the body can really be impacted downstream from stress. Yeah, and I'm going to kind of answer this um, twofold um, because it is very chicken and egg, right? So, you know, when we're under high stress, we can see sterility in the microbiome, which means that we often will have no growth of the lactobacillus and bifido strains. And um, these are the, the strains that make our serotonin and our GABA. So that can gear us to be higher stress mode, right? We don't have that landing gear of the stress response. Also, when we have a sterilized microbiome, this sets us up for bacterial overgrowth. So whether we're looking at dysbiosis or candida albicans or SIBO, um, and that in itself can create then an overdrive of the stress response in the body. So there's the chicken and egg. Stress alone can incre increase our LPS, our lipopolysaccharide, which drills holes in the gut. You know, So we've talked about that connection of how stress alone can drive leaky gut. And then if we have leaky gut from stress, that influence of excessive particle load in our body is going to drive a physiological stress response, right? And so that can actually cross the blood-brain barrier, that can actually drive inflammatory cascades and perpetuate this stress adrenaline survival release. Um, we can see that when we're under chronic stress, we can burn through nutrients, magnesium, glutamine. So the nutrients that aid in the neuromuscular release or that aid or are required for that gut lining support. Um, also, nutrient deficiency can be a driving force of chronic stress response. Uh, we can see an increase of heart rate. Um, we can see increased blood pressure. Uh, we can see blood sugar elevations from that cortico um, um, the glucocorticoid response from our cortisol driving blood sugar spikes. Uh, we can see sleep abnormalities. We can see weight gain, right? So all of these things can impact. And the, the base of these things, like, you know, if we're talking about a dietary influence, this can be, if the body is in an inflammatory diet, that's going to add insult to injury. Um, if we're talking about, you know, uh, chemical drivers of stress, if we're exposed to high amounts of xenoestrogens or we're exposed to toxins from prescription drugs or chemo or radiation, this can drive chronic stress response in our body. Um, so there's some things that are lifestyle oriented that we aren't able to stop or get ahead of. Um, we might be having the emotional drive of stress like work pressures right now or relationship issues or past trauma that's unresolved. And we have to kind of be mindful about which ones are modifiable um, and knowing that there are physiological responses, which ones we can be proactive in as far as regulating based on those, those variables. Yes, I think this is super important because, you know, beyond will and being type A and, you know, feeling like you're rocking it or not suffering, it doesn't even have to be taking on too much or admitting being overwhelmed from work, momming, wearing all the hats. It could be a parasite that you're unaware of, or it could be your exercise class. 
Right. Absolutely. I mean, it could be even a spiritual lack of connection and dealing with depression and that driving the HPA axis overload. Um, so we have to kind of spend a little bit of time looking at inventory and then seeing, we talked about this in past episodes about, you know, the allostatic load, what stressors are worth keeping in your toolbox, like, you know, and what are the things that you're able to release and, you know, a lot of people are asking, is this a good time for detox? Is this a good time for the um, beat the bloat cleanse? And I keep saying yes. Um, now, if you're doing the beat the bloat cleanse and you find that that drives more mood instability, make sure that you're considering supporting your system with more ultimate detox, right? Maybe bring in the rebuild spectrum probiotic earlier. But, but this is a time, this is a slow down time, and this is a time to really work one of those entry points that could be throwing off this HPA axis. And that, that could be gut, and that can definitely be toxin. Totally. And especially for those looking for diet shift, I'm like, you're in full control of yeah. you know, what's coming into your kitchen right now. Granted, you know, takeout and to-go are still available, but most people are cooking at home a heck of a lot more. So if you're looking to get on a new protocol or, or program, now's a great time for that. Most definitely. And I think keto is the best way to do that. You know, um, now I have advised against doing an MRT, like we, we did the MRT promotion, right? And we're saying like, eh, maybe wait to get it run. <laughs> right. Because you might be able to like, food get, scarcity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You might not be able to get that like obscure ingredient that's on your plan for your first two weeks. And yes. then you don't want to create more stress, but, but other no than reason that, you couldn't buy it ahead. <laughs> right. Following the anti-anxiety diet or doing a, you know, anti-inflammatory approach, real food keto would be fantastic now. And, um, I like a lot of people have been doing like, um, COVID-19 ab check, <laughs> like, you know, are we, are we still staying on track? And I think that that's really important. Okay. So I want to touch a little bit on diet and lifestyle elements and kind of other aspects that we can shift in terms of balancing out our HPA access and supporting these glands that we've talked about. But before we do, let's just have a quick word from our sponsor for today's episode, Further Food. Absolutely. And Further Food is a great fit for today's episode as they provide the highest quality collagen, gelatin, and health food tonics. Their collagen is grass-fed, pasture-raised, and wild-caught if you are looking at the cod collagen in their line. All of their products are non-GMO, hormone-free, and antibiotic-free. And when we're talking about things that offset stress to the HPA access, starting with a quality product that can aid in gut support is a big piece of the puzzle. Because if you're dealing with, as I said, leaky gut, you're going to have more food sensitivities, you're going to have more inflammation, and inflammation sends chronic signs of stress signaling to the body. So incorporating collagen into your daily repertoire is a great way to offset your HPA access stress demands and also support against leaky gut and support connective tissue throughout the body. So we're talking hair, skin, nails. In an episode that we've done on the past podcast episodes uh, all about collagen, Becky and I talked about uh, double-blind placebo-controlled research studies that actually compared collagen to placebo and saw that it also reduces cellulite. <laughs> and that was a big turn for Becky and I to say, okay, this is going into at least two scoops a day. <laughs> uh -huh. Yep. In our morning coffee. And I know I've been baking a lot more as of late and using both their collagen and gelatin to ramp up the nutritional profile of like pancakes, muffins, cookies, all the things lately. Yeah. Not only does it add grams of protein, but then it also provides that connective tissue support. And we've seen beyond hair, skin, nails, and gut, even on a vascular side, the role of collagen and gelatin, maintaining the integrity of our vessels, maintaining that elasticity, if you will. So we really recommend incorporating these foods. Uh, something to think about is that the collagen is more flexible in its use with both hot and cold beverages, whereas gelatin will gelatinize, right? 
So be mindful. You'd want to use this more in like gummies or like my avocado breakfast pudding in the anti-anxiety diet cookbook, or like Becky said, to get a chewy texture in a cookie. Um, and gelatin can be used in warm beverages without gelatinizing. But if you put it in something cold, it's going to get more oopy goopy and um, you might want to be mindful of that texture change. But go on over to furtherfood.com and check out their varied sources of collagen as well as their gelatin. Again, both that we recommend as a daily tool in your repertoire. And you can also check out their Mindful Matcha. We'll talk about matcha in a little bit for L-theanine as a tool to support alpha brainwave activity, which can reduce stress and anxiety. Well, providing you a little bit of caffeine without that blunt of a surge that you'll get of epinephrine like you'll get in your coffee or espresso. So go on over to furtherfood.com, use the code AllieMillerRD at checkout, grab a collagen, a gelatin, maybe that mindful matcha. Um, and we hope that you enjoy their products as much as we do. And uh, you will save when you use Allie Miller RD at checkout. Totally. So beyond trying to shift our perspective and, and really own what you can here, how can we work to support the hypothalamus and pituitary glands? Yes. So we want to start with food first. That's always my favorite topic. <laughs> um, and eating a balanced diet is the recommendation that you'll see. And as you know, I hate that type of a vague term because um, often that says things like eat whole grains, X, Y, Z. Uh, but I was able to dig into some actual up-to-date research. And there is a study that I'll link in the show notes. It is entitled Dietary Sugars, Not Lipids, Drive Hypothalamic Inflammation. And this was in the Journal of Molecular Metabolism. And they saw that mice um, that were fed a high sugar diet had more inflammation in the hypothalamus. And they saw that a high fat, high carbohydrate diet was a driver, but not a low carbohydrate, high fat. So if we're doing more of like a ketogenic approach, we can still maintain that satiety and that leptin influence, which is what tells the brain that it's safe, that it's fed. Um, but when we pull the carbohydrates out, we actually see a reduction in ages or those advanced glycation end products, um, which allow optimal brain function, less of that tarry plaque, and overall less inflammation. And then beyond carb control, what about some elements of uh, nourishment or food as medicine focus for balancing the HPA access? Yeah. So this is where, um, you know, like we just said with further foods, we look at the gut as a big entry point of what would drive inflammatory reactions in the body. So bone broth, collagen and gelatin would be great tools there because if you have a healthy epithelial lining or that tissue of the gut is intact, again, that means less particles getting into the bloodstream crossing the blood brain barrier, driving that inflammatory process, telling the brain and the HPA axis that the body's not safe, something's happening. So starting with the gut with bone broth, gelatin and collagen is definitely key. And then healthy fats across the board. So if we're talking about avocado, we're talking about bacon, which is also rich in choline. As you guys know, I'm a big fan of bacon. Um, your uh, saturated fat in the diet from your grass-fed pasture-raised proteins, all would be good fits here. Olive oil, nuts and seeds in their whole form or nut butters. Um, these would all be great because these provide that signal of leptin or satiety. And remember, leptin comes from either the body's use of its own fat as fuel or from the intestines recognizing the fat in the diet. And that's where we see like hypothalamic amenorrhea or imbalance in the HPA axis in individuals that are underweight and don't eat enough fat. So if you're someone that's overweight, um, you could still do a ketogenic diet and get the benefit of the fats, but be mindful to not chase fat because excess body weight itself um, and obesity can be a stressor to the HPA axis as well. And then beyond that, incorporating some really intentional foods like tyrosine-rich foods might be a really good um, call to action as well. Yeah. And the connection there is that tyrosine is the precursor to make dopamine. Um, and tyrosine also is going to play a big role. So, so 
like tryptophan makes serotonin, L-tyrosine produces uh, dopamine, and um, dopamine is made by the adrenals. So that's that bliss reward seeking can aid with cravings. Um, and also with the tyrosine, we can get a boost on the thyroid um, because that um, levothyroxine or what we think of as synthroid medication, um, we know that the thyroid hormone itself actually is produced with tyrosine paired with iodine and then other minerals that help with that deiodinization. Um, so this is where for individuals that are hypothyroid and under stress, they would do really well with our thyroid optimizer formula because it does have that L-tyrosine in there, which can also aid with cravings and helping the body to feel blissful or safe. Uh, I would also incorporate with, we're talking about cravings, chocolate. <laughs> I always love to say chocolate as medicine, um, but raw cacao powder would be a really fantastic one, especially if you can blend it with some adaptogens um, or some medicinal mushrooms. These all aid to mitigate the stress signals to the body. Probiotic rich foods would be great for gut support and aiding in our neurotransmitter production. Um, so cultured vegetables would fit really well in there. Kombucha would be a great fit. Kefir, kraut, and then vitamin C rich foods, like um, when we're talking adrenals, our adrenal rehab shake, which is in our adrenal rehab program. This elixir has um, the zest or the pith incorporated into the shake blended um, from lemons. So you get a lot of those bioflavonoids great during this time of the year for immune health as well. That has coconut milk in there for the fats, and then it uses my grass-fed whey and a hefty amount of salt. I like to use the Redmond Real Salt for that mineral. Um, but the grass-fed whey also is one to note because the immunoglobulins in there aid with the gut integrity. Yep. Love, love, love that shake recipe. I will make sure I link it in today's okay. Lemon notes. creamsicle. Yeah, exactly. Every time exactly. I make it, I'm like, why don't I make this more often? <laughs> yep. I know. I haven't made it in a while, but we're also out of lemon. So <laughs> I don't know how it would be with lime. Uh, we still have some Ooh, limes, but I think maybe. It could, you could rock it could that. Work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and then what about, um, I know some people won't love me for this, but what about the recommendation of reducing caffeine or trying to get off of coffee at least? Yeah. I mean, like I mentioned with the note on matcha, caffeine does drive epinephrine or adrenaline. So reducing your coffee to, because basically if you're stimulating an output that's going to drive adrenaline, that's going to pull the HPA axis to focus on the adrenals because the adrenals are pulling their energy outbound, right? So you have to keep stimulating that pathway. So reducing your caffeine to eight ounces max um, or considering adding CBD. I was just posting last weekend um, the CBD lavender latte that we have on the blog. So we could post that in the show notes as well. Um, CBD does blunt the epinephrine and it also upregulates GABA and GABA is one of those primary feel good landing gear neurotransmitters. Um, you could also play with replacing your coffee with tea, especially matcha, um, because that does have the highest amount of L-theanine, which is nature's chill pill. Um, again, it drives an increase of our alpha brain waves, which aids in concentration, focus, creativity without anxiety or chronic stress response. And um, we've seen that polyphenols have such rich antioxidant capacity. They're like little warriors that actually combat free radicals in the body and neutralize a lot of threats. They also support detoxification. Um, so when we're talking about reducing stressors, tea can be a really great tool to add into your diet. Um, and you can do caffeine free teas like a rooibos tea in the evening. Um, or I talked about one, a couple episodes back from wild foods there. Um, Oh, boogers. It's the lemongrass one that I'm obsessed with. Um, but these are all really great ways to add those phyto compounds to reduce oxidative stress, which means that the HPA access is less stimulated. Is it the Thai G tea? Yeah. The okay. Thai G tea, yes. Yes. I can try that at your house. It is delicious and such a good recommendation too for so many of us that are working from home and, you know, trying not to like go to the fridge between snack. every meeting and snack. Exactly. So like having tea or kind of that as your special treat while you're yep. working, something that's not coffee, preferably switching to decaf, like after, you know, 12 or at least 2 PM. I think that's a really great recommendation. 
Yeah. Any of those kind of, you know, so that is somewhat of like a food distraction, but it's still non-calorie. Right. And <laughs> it's a great way to really feel abundant. And also that Thai G tea um, uses a green rooibos, which can really help as it, not just an antioxidant, but also a stress reducer, which takes me to the next lifestyle point outside of diet, which is getting enough sleep. Yes. Yes, <laughs> and, yes. You know, sleep is like the reset button for your HPA access. In your sleep state is when the brain and body should be able to feel the most safe, right? And we've seen in research, uh, there's a study that I'll share with listeners, a uh, study from 2014 that looked at sleep deprivation associated with hypothalamic dysfunction. And um, so there is that direct relationship with this HPA access. And, you know, we want to think of things like blackout curtains and getting into a dark space. I earlier recommended getting outside within the first two hours of rise to push the reset button on your circadian rhythm. And that actually helps then with the melatonin as the, the lighting gets darker. That also is why in the evening time we want to cut out screens. Um, I am a huge fan though of my sleep mask. I'm, I'm, I think also partially addicted to just the sensation of it on my head. <laughs> like it's a routine that tells my brain, okay, this is the sleep time. Um, and routine is so important. We think of that with, you know, babies and toddlers and children, but so important in adults, even, you know, getting into your rituals of, okay, now you do your face mask, you do your cleanse, you, um, you know, roll your back out, you do some stretching, maybe some, uh, reflection time or journaling and all of these little rituals get your body into that space that says, oh, this is the time to shut it down. Um, the National Sleep Foundation notes that 65 degrees is the ideal temperature. I feel like my husband would have a total like dad moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People are like, hey, don't touch the thermostat. Um, but you know, like 65 is pretty cold. Um, but I do like to keep the house uh, below 70 or at 70. And I find that keeping the fan on high, at least creating a cold environment in our bedroom, cold and dark is really ideal. Oh man. Uh, Byron opens the window when it is not super hot outside to try to get it to that ideal temperature. But yeah, he wouldn't be on board with the 65 set <laughs> thermostat <Expensive>. either. <laughs> yeah, totally. To quote uh, Joe Exotic, we'll never financially recover from this. <laughs> yes, thank you from your, from your sleep. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and then what about exercise? I know this one can be like a very double-edged sword when it comes to the HPA access, but what type of exercise is found to be beneficial? What are your recommendations there? Yeah. So exercise is definitely a stressor to our adrenal glands. And we talk about this a lot in the adrenal rehab program as well, but we've also seen in research that um, if we're too sedentary and we aren't incorporating mild or regular exercise, and they did note aerobic exercise, um, to really aid in the hypothalamic inflammation. So to reduce that inflammation in the brain, we do not want to be sedentary. We do want to be moving. We want to use um, body weight and some weight bearing exercise, but generally we want to keep the VO, VO2 max under 60%. And there is this linear relationship when we get into like more of the HIIT training or we're really surging with sprints and such, and the intensity threshold goes up, um, that can really drive that ACTH um, to be released from the pituitary and cortisol to be released from the adrenals. And that can interfere both with muscle recovery and it can also drive just kind of a chronic adrenal burnout. But we have seen, to be fair, with um, you know high-performance athletes, um, when we support their adrenal glands, and that's where we're seeing a lot of performance with like the adaptogens and also, you know, ensuring that we have balanced diet, that the body can adapt to this stress um, of exercise, but it is something we want to be mindful of to not jump in and add an extra stressor of exercise that's mimicking survival, if you will. You know, the body doesn't know, am I running from a cheetah or am I doing a Peloton class? <laughs> no. Totally. So a really good time for like yoga, gentle movement therapy. I know a lot of studios, you know, have taken their, their business completely online and are offering really low rates or even like free classes right now as just a way to like dip in and, and give it a try, but probably don't want to do like the, you know, Barry's boot camp online or something like that right now. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking not, nope. <laughs> not so much. And then I just want to harp a little bit longer on the mental state and emotional side of things. Um, sure. So I love the work by Dr. Bernie Siegel. Uh, he has the book, Love, Medicine and Miracles. And um, I've referenced the study where, you know, he told clients that they were getting a new chemotherapy drug and it was actually just saline. And um, they did see 80% of them vomited or retched. So that was, you know, a, a big placebo influence there. Um, and then 30% of the individuals actually lost their hair. That's really wild to me because I know the connection of your enteric nervous system and your thoughts. Like, you know, if you start to feel anxious or you're going on stage or something new is happening that drives anxiety or, or adrenaline, you get butterflies in the belly. So I could see that gut connection. But I've never seen something like that where 30% of the people in this study had hair loss from that perceived belief that they were taking a drug that would drive hair loss. So it's important to, to really unpack this in how this would influence, influence us on our life and our daily basis, how negative emotions truly perpetuate a survival mode in the brain. And that can impact our entire not just HPA axis, but our entire body, right? That can impact our hormones. It can impact our thyroid, our gut, our nutrient status. And if the body's in this chronic sympathetic fight or flight response, just from thoughts, that can be the greatest perpetuator of illness, you know? So it's important to consider neutrality over negativity. There might not be an appropriate time to always feel like poly positive and like things are awesome. I'm so enjoying not seeing my friends and all the things, but we can at least be mindful of common offenders of negative terms like awful, bad, ugly, hate, nothing, horrible, failure, um, can't. And then there's even hidden words like should, never, wish, enough, um, any, you know, NT at the end of a word basically, or almost or not. Um, so, you know, if, if, if a phrase is coming to us like, Oh, I, I can't do this. I can't take this any longer. Can't is already a negative word, right? <laughs> um, uh, or this is really trying my patience. I don't think I'm going to be able to make it until, you know, the end of May or what the hell's going on X, Y, Z. If we can just rephrase any negative terms or thoughts where we feel victimized, where we feel out of control and replace that negative term with something neutral, um, like each day is unknown and I choose to seek positivity or I seek the light throughout all conditions, or um, I'm learning more about myself every day, or you know, there's ways to neutralize the negative terms, and this really will shift the lens in which you view yourself within your day-to-day -day function. It will shift the relationships that you have because other people feel and perceive that energy, and it will literally physiologically shift your body. Yes. And I really love how empowering this is. You know, we can always control our reaction to things and, and try to retain that kind of membrane of protection against anxiety or palpable fear. And this is something we cover a lot in the adrenal rehab program um, that we launched in the fall of last year. But I want to take a moment and just um, let listeners know what all is included and how they may want to take advantage of jumping in and, and joining at this time at that 50% off discount that we're offering. Yes. So I created my adrenal rehab program to combine the science and strategy of how to understand the status of your adrenal glands current, the influencing factors, and really providing you with tools to mellow your mind and harness that chronic stress fight or flight response in your body. Um, like I said, unfortunately, we're all kind of hardwired for survival. And at any times of influencing change of environment or mental or physiological conditions that drive stress, we really would perform best if we are empowered with tools to modulate this fight or flight response. So the program is evergreen, meaning that it's, you know, all of the materials are already uploaded into the classroom. There is three hours of video content, but I made sure to keep each video maxed at, I think, 12 minutes. 
So they're deep, nerdy, you know, alley level of information, but you're able to really compartmentalize them and digest them, if you will, take notes. There's customized interactive worksheets. There's a lot of supportive materials. There's a weekly email that's released for the first four weeks after you've purchased it to kind of keep you on par with staying up to date with the materials. I do five cooking demos during this program. So you can actually learn my low carb collagen zucchini muffins, my matcha lime pudding with blackberries, a turmeric coconut chicken thigh recipe, and my delicious cauliflower chowder, as well as lemon lavender CBD balls. So you of course get all those recipes, but you get to watch the cooking demos. And in each cooking demo, I give you different tips about you know why we cook bone and skin on with chicken thighs and things to look for before you flip them. A lot of techniques and um, application that will go beyond those recipes. And then another resource within the program is a supplement and advanced lab testing recommendation guide. So we've seen hundreds of people go through this program. A lot of people state that after they've read the anti-anxiety diet book and they've been playing with the cookbook, that this was really the program that kicked things into high gear and started to really manifest change. A lot of aha moments. Um, we cover keto, we cover leptin, we cover carb cycling, we cover various forms of intermittent fasting, and so much lifestyle strategy, as well as techniques to maintain the framework of your mental space, your thoughts. We talk about mantras, removing negativity, probiotic challenge. I think it's kind of a, an all-in-one encompassing starting point and at this time really highly needed. So I have provided a 50% off discount code. I hope you'll all check it out and I hope that it's a supportive resource for you all as we ride through this transition. Yes, and that code for listeners I'll include in the show notes, but it's Adrenal April, and that'll get you the 50% off through the end of April, but probably best to start this now um, while you've got kind of the unknown amount of downtime left, a really, really good way to make sure that something very positive comes out of all of this. Yeah. I mean, what are we going to manifest with this downtime? And I think that's one exactly. thing that you could really create, like I said, and, and own these tools that we provide to you in the program. Okay. And then let's just hit on maybe some supplemental support. I don't know that we've talked a lot we about this. We haven't talked about in, supplements in this, at all yet. How did that happen? I know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Good for us. Um, so let, let's hit it on, on supplemental support for Tonifying the HPA access, any particular formulas that you recommend like dialing up during a stressful time and maybe even what your personal strategy looks like right now. Totally. Okay. So um, I have to say Calm and Clear as the number one. Um, Calm and Clear is a blended formula that combines B vitamins, nervines, adaptogens, and amino acids. So the B vitamins that are provided aid as cofactors to activate neurotransmitters. Um, B5 specifically, or pantothenate, really heavily required for optimal adrenal health. And so when we get an ample level of the B5, that means that the adrenal glands themselves as glands are less stressed, <laughs> they're nourished, and that means that likely they'll be less taxing on that access itself. Um, and then again, as we're making neurotransmitters or activating them, we should have a more balanced orchestra, if you will, in our mental space. Um, mood stability, and that comes hand in hand with nervines that are added into the formula. So nervines are herbs that mellow us out, calm down our nervous system, if you will. And then adaptogens, uh, namely ashwagandha is in this formula. Adaptogens aid in us adapting to high stress demand. And ashwagandha is one of those adaptogens that is more of a calming, mellowing out adaptogen that you can take in the evening. Um, there's L-theanine in this formula as well as phosphatidylserine. I've talked about L-theanine in the constructs of matcha and the alpha brainwaves, but phosphatidylserine also plays a role in um, blunting cortisol release. So it reduces that cortisol output, um, which is really important during this time of higher stress unknown. And um, yeah, I recommend distributing it throughout the day. I will say Calm and Clear is one that I notice a direct influence from if I've missed a dosage. Um, I start to get a little bit wiry. I start to get in an over-ruminating state. I start to get almost a little panicked even. Um, and I am someone who runs prone anxiety. Um, but I right now am 
pretty much hanging at eight a day. Um, so I'm doing two to three at rise, midday, and bed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then what about um, use of adaptogen boost, GABAcom, all of yeah. those? <laughs> yeah. So adaptogen boost is then using adaptogens, which again are herbs that aid us to be more resilient. So adaptogens can support stamina, energy. Um, they can also have mood boosting effects like rhodiola, which is in the formula, has been shown to be antidepressant in its um, relationship in the brain and body and also enhancing cognitive function, reducing mental fatigue. So this incorporates rhodiola, panax, ginseng, and cordyceps. Uh, cordyceps also aid in exercise performance, learning, memory, reducing free radicals, so reducing that oxidative stress in the body, protecting our nervous system. Adaptogen boost, unlike Calm and Clear, though, is one that should stay in the morning and midday and really should be cut off by like 5 or 6 p.m. because that is more of a stimulating blend of adaptogens, whereas the Calm and Clear, the adaptogens that are blended in there with the nervines are more of the calming family. So adaptogen boost helps more for the stress-induced fatigue or the burnout and aids in that resilience. So I take that um, like one to two at rise and one to two at like three or 4 p.m. to get me through my day. And then GABA Calm is like, is a chewable tablet that acts like a light switch, basically. It reduces that um, sense of panic or stress response on a peripheral level, so takes out tremors or shakiness. Um, I've been using this anytime almost I've been leaving the house, <laughs> especially if I'm going to like the grocery store where right now there is this palpable anxiety that I can just feel in the environment. Um, mm -hmm. Gabacalm really helps to take that edge off and um, just, just that, that general sense of unease. Um, it's great formula to use preemptive or reactive at a time of stress or anxiety. And um, like two to four of those chews can be distributed throughout the day. So that's like letting the steam train out of the tank, whereas adaptogen boost is picking you up when you feel like a stretched out rubber band that doesn't want to get off the couch. And Calm and Clear helps to kind of create that pendulum swing all the way in between all of those spaces. Totally. And, and um, all three of those are actually included in our stress manager bundle. So I'll make sure to link that in the show notes as well. Um, especially if you haven't tried any of those formulas uh, before and are feeling inspired by today's episode, really good way to get started and get a discount on those three. Yes. And then maca would have to call out, and I could have put that maybe in the food is medicine section, but maca really fantastic tool to aid in tonifying the pituitary. It's a Peruvian root, which has also been said to boost libido and fertility. And it's because it does directly impact that pituitary gland, which plays a role with our FSH and our LH and our oxytocin and all of that area where we regulate sexual hormone, um, as well as you know that libido and, and mood and connection. So maca also is classified as an adaptogen. It can be somewhat stimulating as well, so that would work well blended in your coffee in the morning. Um, or you know we have a ton of recipes on the blog that we can link in the show notes. Um, about 500 milligrams once or twice a day in a capsule if you choose to do that. Um, but it does blend really well into like nut balls and a bunch of different recipes that we'll, we'll share. Pairs super well with chocolate. That's always my favorite yeah. delivery. That um, Valentine's Day um, maca cacao, is it avocado pudding, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be that a good for one. Sure. Okay. Uh -huh. We'll have to promote that on Instagram this week. Okay. <laughs> Share well, that with everyone. Good. Yes. Yes. But be mindful, you guys, um, be mindful of the, the COVID-19 baby boom. So <laughs> be yeah. mindful of your, um, uh, what is that called? Natural birth control methods <laughs> during this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like get me. your, get your daisy out or your thermometer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Most definitely. Um, but I will say actually in closing, um, that, you know, sex actually is a great release to be honest. Um, and so, you know, when we're thinking about lifestyle support for all of this, um, we do see that orgasm can be a really great release. Um, and so that's something to consider whether you have a partner or not. Um, but at least weekly, um, focusing on that release. And we do know that there's a lot of immune boosting, um, elements with orgasm and, and, uh, a robust sex life. Um, so that would be kind of in my, uh, overall summary of tips would also be beyond getting the, the bright daylight, getting your quality sleep, 
having a fat fueled diet, reducing caffeine, um, managing blood sugar levels, which kind of goes in that fat fuel diet, um, would also be, you know, ensuring that you are uh, maintaining a healthy sex life because that's a great way to release, a great way to connect and a great way to, to feel safe. The body pushes that reset button as well. Might as well if you got nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So hopefully y'all thought that today's episode was helpful um, and you've learned something geeky about your hypothalamus and your pituitary and um, really understanding how this access can keep you in regulatory optimal mode. If you enjoyed the podcast, go on over to where you listened to it, whether that's Spotify or iTunes and leave us a five-star review with maybe a phrase on what you love. Also, check out AllieMillerRD.com, and I'm so stoked to share with you in mid-May our new website, so stay tuned for that. And when you're on my website, consider snagging a spot in Adrenal Rehab, which would give you a lot of tools in your tool belt to be resilient to stress, to ensure that you're being proactive at this time, to maintain that safety valve on the tank of unknown, and um, really feel grounded. And I think that that's the best way that we can stay together strong as a community. Thank you for listening to the Naturally Nourished podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at AllieMillerRD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well. <laughs>